أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته برادرز الحمد لله that we have some opportunity from Allah سبحانه وتعالى to talk about uh, one of the surah of the Quran today as you know that usually the Sheikh Yusuf uh, give the lecture but uh, unfortunately um, he has to attend uh, to the hospital because of his uh, wife sickness and pregnancy so he apologized and he said that he won't be able to come today inshallah next week he will resume so we have this opportunity today to go through uh, one of the surah of the Quran which is one of the beautiful surah so obviously um, this surah surah al-fat that we're going to talk about today uh, just want to give it a little bit of background uh, we'll start with the hadith uh, that prophet Muhammad said about this surah is it she said okay So we start with a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam about the surah. What he said about this surah that this surah is more beloved to me, as he described sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as the sun falls on any of the things in the world. So meaning that when the sun, the sun rays of the you know, the touches that everything of the world, he loves this surah even more than that. And why is so? This surah is talked about, the fat means victory or opening. Before we go into the surah and go through the ayah by ayah, uh, we need to know a little bit of background, historical background of the surah. I think more or less, all of you know, if you are uh, connected with the Quran and if you uh, listen to the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you probably know this surah is about the, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is something, an event that happened in the sixth year of the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the background of that is that the Prophet ﷺ, when he left Mecca and went for Medina, as you all know, that in the very first year he had the Battle of Badr. So Muslim had to fight with the Quraysh, and that was a uh, resounding victory for Muslims. And Muslim win over, you know, they killed almost 70 Quraysh, the big leaders of the Quraysh, including Abu Jahl, who was killed in the Battle of Badr. But the very next year, uh, it is the will of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that there is another battle happening, the Battle of Uhud. And due to some reasons, some obedience or disobedience, you know, some of the wrong decisions, you know, it fall that, you know, we lost, the Muslim lost almost 70 lives, including the beloved, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, also other, you know, prominent sahaba, they passed away and they gave shaheed in, the, in this battle of Uhud. And because of that, uh, as the leader of the battle, on the other side of Quraysh, the Abu Sufyan, he said that, you know, Today we are the winner, you know, the, the Laat and Uzza, like we are the worshipper of Laat and Uzza, and we are the winner, and they are with us. And they also declare that they're going to come back again to finish, finish the Muslim group. And that's what happened actually. You know, the very next year after that, almost 10,000 10, Arabs, the Bedouins, they grouped together in the Battle of Ahzab, and they all surrounded the Medina. And that's when, which is known as the Battle of Khandaq also, that's when the, you know, the Sahaba Salman al-Farsi, he gave an idea that to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because they are surrounding us, you know, we should dig a trench near the, you know, around the Medina so that they cannot overcome and come to us, you know, and, and attack us. And that trench actually hold them up. And, you know, it was towards the end of the, but, uh, end of the siege that the Sahaba, they are almost falling apart. You know, they, and Allah described in the Surah Al-Ahzab that, you know, their heart was in their throat. Meaning they are so scared, and, and the last night, you know, if you, if you read through the Sirah of Rasulullah Islam, he said that, you know, nobody wants to go to the enemy field and, and get the information. And then he, he Rasulullah Islam, he chose Hudayfiyah, and he went there to get some information. And it is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of one person who is a neutral to Quraysh and neutral to the Muslim, this battle actually ended up in a retreat. Meaning that the people, the 10,000 people, they couldn't do much. You know, there was a little bit of skirmish here and there, but the people of the Ahzab, they had to leave Medina and they, they went away. So it was not a victory for them at all. On the other hand, 
that the Muslim, they also been saved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But now, when they went there, the, all the other tribes of the Arab land, they have supported the Quraysh. They came to this battle of Khandaq, Ahzab, but they didn't gain anything. Usually at that time when the people come to do the battle, you know, and they try to get something out of it. They, they also get the booties, you know, the, 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 the crops, the, the, the animals and everything, but they didn't get anything. So they kind of lost the trust. Politically, they kind of lost the trust with, with the Quraysh. So politically, Quraysh was far back behind. And just at that time, after the battle of Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw, show, show a dream to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in the dream, he saw that, you know, he is shaving his head and he's doing tawaf around the Kaaba and he's doing hajj. He's doing hajj. And to do hajj, of course, he had to go to Makkah. But Makkah is under the, under the territory of the Quraysh. Okay. But still, Prophet saw the dream. And he told all the Muslim of the Badr, this is what I have seen. And this is what Allah is instructing him to do. So we'll go. We'll go to Makkah and we'll do the Hajj. And 1400 Muslims, without any question, they followed Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the story begins from there. The, the, the battle of the Hudaybiyah, the, the treaty of Hudaybiyah, the day of Hudaybiyah, it starts from there. And we need to know the background because there are a few incidents happens on, the, on that day. And that's why it's so remarkable. And as a Muslim, we should know these things because if you really want to understand Quran, if you really want to understand the surahs like this, you need to have the clear idea that what went through their mind. Nowadays, we understand Quran is a book. So if I say, brother, show me this surah, you will maybe open up from your iPhone or iPad, you know, and I'll take a book, the Quran, the Arabic version of the, the Madinian version, you're going you're gonna to take it, show me. But for them, Quran was something from the speech of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa nothing else. And it's coming, it's fresh. It's coming from Jibril and he's telling. So, Prophet saw a dream, they have to go. And when they went there, as you all know, they couldn't take a straight path. It was a long journey. And they know that they will be attacked in this way. So they had to take a way that is full of throne and everything. And they had to go through so much struggle. And when they reach Hudaybiyah, uh, the place where, where they camp and camp there, they know that you know already the Quraysh has known about this one, and they are sending a group of people to kill them. And they sent 80 people. 80 people to kill the Muslims because they thought the Quraysh were happy that they are coming to us with us. You know, this is our chance, we're going to finish them all here. But those 80 people who came with the arms, you know, Prophet Islam and his, and his the Sahaba as well, they captured him. And they wanted to kill him, but Prophet said, No, take their weapon and let them go. So they went back. So they went back. And then when they started, you know, to talk, because they are also a big number, the 1400 people. So even the other tribes, the nearby tribes, not the Quraysh, they also felt a sense of insecurity. They think, okay, no, let's go. Maybe, maybe, maybe this, if this something happened now, it could be bad for us because we didn't get anything in the Ahzab, the last battle. So if it happens in the Makkah, you know, instead of, you know, there are 1400 people, it's not a small number. Although Quraysh has more number in their side, but they say, no, let's talk about them. That's why some people from the other tribe, the, the tribes of Khuza, the people from Taif, they went and tried to negotiate. And as you all know, in the negotiation, part, you know, a lot of things happen up and down, you know, the emotion goes up and down. And one of the things that happened, you know, one of the guys named Budai, he came and he was talking to Rasulullah in a derogative way. He was telling, you know, you are coming not even with the tribes, you have different people around you. You know, some people are from Yemen, some people are from Medina, some are this, some are young, some are old. What do you, do you think these people will follow you? And this was something that, you know, uh, enraged, you know, anger in the, in the, in, among the Sahaba. And you know Abu Bakr, you know people like Abu Bakr, you know he's the he's a Siddiq, you know he's the best man after any prophet, as Prophet Sallallahu mentioned in all of Hadith, right? He's the best man in the planet after any prophet, and he even cursed this person. So imagine how much anger the Sahaba has in their heart at that time. Even a person like Abu Bakr, he 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 threw a wild wild curse to these people, you know, it's such a curse that you can't even translate that. To be honest, you know, it's, it's, it's something very very bad, you know, a very very bad language that Abu Bakr used. But because that is from his emotion, he did it. And also on the other hand, so nothing was moving. So they cannot go to Makkah. No negotiation is taking place. So they're, they're waiting there and they're waiting for, you know, the instruction of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet also got no instruction to fight with them because they cannot fight. Because they're trying to approach the Makkah, approach the Kaaba, where the camel of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sat down and it's not moving. 
and everybody started talking that you know the the camera of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, his sin was kaswa. That you know he he sat down, he was not moving, he went he went crazy. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said no, kaswa is okay. He's nothing gone wrong with him. The one who stopped the elephant, he is the same one who stopped my camel. So he's saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala who stopped the camel to attack the Kaaba, he is the one who told my camel to sit down. So that's the indication that Allah doesn't want fighting. Allah doesn't want fighting. Otherwise, my camel would have sit down. And this also makes Haba more, you know, because they have came through a long way, a lot, lot of hard work they have done so far, and they wanted to go inside the Kaaba and do their Hajj. Everybody wants to see the Kaaba. This was their home. This is why they grew up, most of the Muhajirun. So, but they still cannot disobey Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And then, in between the talk going on, you know, people are coming and saying other things. And finally, the people, one, you know, the, the Suhail ibn Amr, he was the, the speaker, you can say, speaker of the Quraysh. He came and wants to talk to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And when they say, okay, let's write down something. Why did the Quraysh agree, agree to do so? Why did they dare attack? Because they were getting information from the other people that you know, uh, even they are also in. They are full of anger. They're full of you know, uh, in anxiety. So if you, if you fight with them and they are united, the main message of their united. So they were saying that the, the people from Kuza, like the people, uh, the Abu Urwa, there's a guy named Abu Urwa from Taif. He said, I have never seen any other king in the whole world. You know, he he speech and the Sahaba around him they catches his speech. He, he do do and the water before the water drops they catch him. So no other king in the world has this many people obedient to him so much. So this put you know you know fear in the heart of the heart of the Quraysh, and that's why they also do not want to fight. They also want to talk. And when they coming to talk, when Suhail ibn Umar went and, and start to write a treaty, that already means that you know they have already understood. No, it's not the time for fighting. It is something that we should we should negotiate. And as you all know, probably the story of the treaty, you know, Prophet Muhammad said, write in the name of Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And Suhail ibn Amr said, no, I can say Bismillah, but I don't know who is Rahman, who is Rahim. If we believe who is Rahman and Rahim, then we don't have to talk. You know, we don't have to make a treaty, then I believe in what you're saying. So Prophet Muhammad said, okay, write whatever he's saying. And then he said, you know, in the name of Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman you know, and I, Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, starting. He said, no, I, I don't know Rasulullah. I don't know Rasulullah. You are Rasul, you know, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. That's what I know. If you, if you believe you are Rasulullah, then you know we don't need to talk. You know? So Prophet also agreed on that one. So he told someone to write his name off and he write Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And the treaty goes on like this. Everything goes on the favor of, favor of the Quraysh. They say that, you know, if any person, any person from our side became Muslim and went there, and if you, if you capture them, if we capture them, you have to return them to back to us. You have to return that person back to us. But if your person come to us, it's up to us whether we give them or not. Also, they say there is no fighting within 10 years. So you're not going to fight with Quraysh in the next 10 years. So no fighting. But you can do treaties with other people. So other tribes can come to you and you can go to other tribes and everything. So this was everything going against, a sin that is going against, against the Muslim people. <coughs> And in between, the same Suhail ibn Amr, he had two sons. One of his sons became Muslim and he fought against his dad in the battle of Badr. Another son, Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal, he was also a Muslim, but he couldn't escape Mecca. He was in Mecca at that time. But somehow he escaped and come to the place of Hudaybiyah because he heard that the 1400 Muslim is there. So he, he thought, this is my chance. I will go to Rasulullah Sallallahu and I'll tell him, take me with you in Medina. I've been prisoned here by my father, I've been tortured by my father, come take me. And he somehow managed to go there, and he in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I am here, take me with you. Take me with you today, I don't, I don't want to stay in Makkah anymore, I want to go to your, your city, Medina. And so he lived there and said, no, this is the first one as my treaty. Because we captured him, although he's a Muslim, we have to return him back. And the Sahaba saw that you know how he's been tortured in front of a, a Muslim, a brother, how he's been tortured in front of them. They were enraged. And in one situation, actually, Umar ibn Khattab, he said to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, actually, he said to Abu Jandal that Abu Abu Jandal, because our Nabi, our Prophet, told us not to do anything, so I cannot do anything. But you can take my sword. My sword is still hanging in my saddle, in my horse. So take it and you know kill your dad, and then it's all over. 
but he couldn't do it because it is his father. So Prophet has to give Abu Jandal back to Suhail ibn Amr. So that makes the older Sahaba more angry, you know, and the more frustration in there. You know, what are we gaining here? We came to do Hajj after so, traveling almost 10, 11 days. We can't even enter to Makkah. And one of the teachers was, you know, this year you cannot do Hajj. One of the treaty, one of the agreement is that you cannot do Hajj this year. If you can do it, we can give you a chance for three, four days next year. So all of this coming here is in vain. And before this treaty was happening, there's another incident happened. A rumor about Usman. The Usman Prophet said, Prophet actually wanted to send Umar ibn Khattab to the Makkah and get some information about the Muslim and the prisoner there. But Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, I have no one from my tribe in there. I mean, I can fight with them. But you know, there's no one to save me, you know, that will be, you know, chaos. It's better you send Usman. So Usman was there. But Usman took a little while because he was meeting the other people or had and relatives and other things. So the rumor came back that Usman was been killed. He's coming, he's not coming back, he's late, he's coming back late. And that time even the Prophet Muslim, look, everything is going through according to Allah subhanahu. Allah would have sent Jibril and told Prophet, no, Usman is all good, no problem. Don't worry about it. Allah didn't send Jibril at that time. Even Prophet Islam, he became anxious and he became angry and he said, okay, if they have killed Osman, then we will fight. And he asked the allegiance of everybody. So all the 1400 people, they come under a tree and they give baya to Rasulullah Sallallahu that yes, we are ready. Baya means that you know, they are giving their life away. That, okay, we'll go inside now. We have to revenge the death of Osman and whatever is the case, we don't care. We will die, we'll do or die. So that baya is done. But as soon as they get ready to go that they saw Osman is coming. And you know, that's kind of another frustration because you know, when you are so emotional, you're charged up that you know, I'm gonna go and fight now because they have killed me. And you see Osman is coming, you know, there's nothing happened. You have to pass this anger to somewhere else. So, you know, that's also a good news for them, but they couldn't hold that emotion under. And the last but not the least, when Abu Jandal, you know, couldn't save himself, and Prophet has to give him back. And at the end, Prophet advised Abu Jandal, Oh Abu Jandal, I know you've been tortured, but this is the treaty that we have signed. Actually, in, in one, one part, Prophet said, you know, we haven't signed the contract yet. I mean, it's not done yet. We're just writing it right now. So Halim Niramur said, no, when you say that, that's done. So I'm taking my son back as, as a prisoner. And at that time, Prophet told Abu Jandal, Oh Abu Jandal, you go back, have patience, Allah will make a way out for you. Allah will make a way out for you. And when Abu Jandal went, you know, Suhail ibn Yano dragged Abu Jandal and going in front of all the 1400 Muslims and he has his treaty in his hand, everything in their favor. So the Muslim was couldn't take it anymore. And among all of the people, Omar ibn Khattab, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. So he asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, are you not the true messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Didn't you see the dream? Didn't you say us that you're going to do Hajj this year? He, he's asking question to Rasulullah. And Prophet said, yes. In near Rasulullah. Definitely I'm Rasulullah. He's only saying this one. And then Abu Bakr somehow stopped Omar. At the beginning, Abu Bakr also didn't stop Omar because everybody's silent. Omar is shouting in front of Rasulullah. Everybody is not shouting with, with him, but they are not even stopping him. They are also the same feeling that you're gonna this is this is valid. What what Omar is asking, kind of they're giving a silent validation to him. Yes, I think he's right because. That's what Prophet said. So they have doubt about Muslims. When you ask Prophet Sallam, that you know, are you the true messenger of Allah? Didn't you say, see the dream? Did you say we're gonna do the do the Hajj today? And Prophet said, yes, I saw the dream. And but I didn't tell that we're gonna do Hajj in this year. But it's still that answer is not satisfactory for them. Because you know, they are here to do Hajj and they, they're seeing in front of every point, they're losing their patience. And they say, We are on Haq. We are in Islam, we are in the our, our deen is the best thing. You know, why why are you stopping here? And they already have experience of Badr, they have experience of Uhud. It's not like this is the first time they're fighting. So they're all ready to fight. But still they cannot do because of this, because of this treaty. And then later on, Omar bin stopped by Abu Bakr and he understood that, no, he shouldn't have done so. He shouldn't have done so. And that's when Prophet Islam, at the end of this comment, he said to everyone that stand up, shave your hair and sacrifice your enemy. So they didn't do Hajj, they couldn't go to Makkah. But it is in station that no, you have to do this one. And he asked three times, stand up, shave your hair, and sacrifice your animal. Nobody moved. Not a single Sahaba, including Abu Bakr, Osman, Omar, Ali, whoever was there. Nobody moved. 
three times and it never happened ever in the life of Prophet This Sahaba, even if Prophet just raised his eyebrow, they go and give their life. But now, because the frustration is so much, they are not even listening to him. They are just listening to him but they are not doing what he is asking to do them. Not one time, not two times, three times he asked. So you can understand the frustration in their hearts and at the, the, the height of their anger at that moment. Then Prophet Islam also became, he also became demoralized, kind of. He said, why are they listening to us? And he went back and that's in rescue, you know, our mother Umm Salama, the wife of Rasulullah, he, she came and she said, what do you want, Ya Rasulullah? You want them to follow what you want them to, what you're saying? You want them to follow you? Yes, of course I want them to follow you. Then you do, you call your barber, you shave your hair, and you sacrifice your animal. And when Prophet Islam did so, everybody followed that. And why they, want, they don't want to do this? Because this animal they sacrifice, what are they going to do with the meat? They can't take the meat, they don't have a freezer, you know, like, like we have, or they're going to pack it up. All will go to Quraysh. All this animal that they brought from Medina, all will. So that's another loss, if you think like this way. That's another frustration for them. But still, Prophet Islam did, and that's why they did. And now it is time to pack up and go back, back to Medina. Going back to Medina because there's not, nothing else to do. So they all shave their hair, they sacrifice the animal, the animal will be taken and you know distributed among the Quraysh. Okay, and also you know they have shaved, you know, they, they, they haven't done the Hajj but they have done the other rituals. So, but they have to go back and they have to come back next year. And when they were going back, at that time, Prophet, you know, when he was in his own camel, the Al Umar realized that you know there's something that he had done very, very bad. Very bad. He said he thinks that you know he's all his deed is gone. All his deed has been gone. Because he raised his voice, you know, the voice of Rasulullah, he asked questions something. So he went to Rasulullah to ask, him, ask for a, one minute to have a word, to ask forgiveness, obviously, to him. But Prophet was not talking to him, was not responding to him. He asked again and he's not responding. He asked again, Ya Rasulullah, give me one minute, you know, one, one word with you. One word I will talk to you. And he didn't respond. Then Prophet looked at him and he was smiling and he was beaming his face. And he said to Omar, oh Omar, and he recited the whole of Surah Fatha. And that is the time. Why didn't he respond? Because Surah Fatha was coming down to him. The whole 29 ayah, from first to the last. And he was so much enjoyed. And he recited the whole Surah to Omar, brother Al, and he told him, tell everybody, that inna fatha nalaka fatha mubina. Allah has given us a clear victory. And Omar said, okay, this is victory? I mean, they can't understand. How come this is a victory? What, at, at what point? We have gained nothing. You know, we lost our animals. We came through all this way. We, we, we couldn't take our Muslim brother Abu Jandal. We saw that he's been dragged to torture prison again. And, we have, and how can it be a victory? And that's when the surah came. And now, if you look at the surah, if you read the surah, now we'll understand that how this surah is a victory for us. And we know that actually later on. We know that from the later on that you know, this Hudaybiyah, once the treaty has been done and there's no fighting between Quraysh and, and the Muslim, between Makkah and Medina, and that is the time in the, in the next one or two years, most number of people around the, around the Kaaba, they came and accepted Islam. The number of Muslim increased, you know, abundantly because of the treaty, because there's nobody is fighting, you know, and Islam is the, is the religion of peace and everything. And also from the political point of view, because they know that, you know, Quraysh couldn't handle this 1400, Quraysh couldn't kill them because for a lot of people, they don't understand, you know, for the tribe, the normal tribe, they say, okay, it's either he or him. Like, you have to win this one or you have to lose this one. But when they say, no, they came to Makkah, they couldn't get in, but they are also dead. Quraysh couldn't kill them at all. So they know that there's something is going on. And that's why a lot of people accepted Islam. And also, because of this treaty, and when the Quraysh fought with someone, some Muslim later on, you know, and, and, and that was you know, against the treaty, and then... Allah gave the clear victory to the Fatih Makkah. And when the Fatih Makkah, when they came into the Makkah, and in the eighth year of Hijrah, they couldn't even fight. The Quraysh was hiding behind their walls. And that's why when the fighting was happening, someone, someone broke the treaty from the Quraysh side. Abu Sufyan, the leader, you can say the president of the Quraysh, or whatever prime minister at that time, he's the, he's the leader of that time. He went back to Medina to seeking forgiveness, and somehow, he, because he knows that the treaty was broken. And when the treaty is broken, the Muslim will come. And now the Muslim is not 1400. It's much more than that. Much more than that. And he went to Medina. And he is one of his daughters 
is one of our mother. You know, his name is um, uh, Ramla ibn Abu Sufyan. So she was uh, uh, anha. She was the daughter and she was in Medina. So obviously Abu Sufyan went to his daughter first. And he said, you know, one of our people has broke the treaty. But before he even start talking to his daughter, he was trying to sit down and, you know, his, his daughter, you know, uh, our mother, she took the mat, the mattress, whatever mattress, she rolled up the mattress. And Abu Sufyan was said, why did you roll up the mattress? Is, it, is that mattress too bad for me to sit down or am I too bad for the mattress? So, you know, Abu, the, the daughter of Abu Sufyan, our mother, she said, no, this is the mattress of Rasulullah sallallahu And innaka mushrikun najus. And you are a mushrik and you are najas. So I can't let you sit on the mattress of my Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And then Abu Sufyan understood that there's no point talking to her anymore. Because, you know, it's all loyalty there. And Abu Sufyan tried his best. And, you know, and the best thing he could get out of this conversation, he went to Ali, he went to Abu Bakr, he went to Omar, nobody helped him. And Ali somehow talked a little bit more and gave him a chance to talk to Prophet Muhammad Even that didn't work. Then the uncle of Prophet Muhammad he gave him a chance to talk to him. But it didn't help much. Only thing he got that whoever will be residing in the house of Abu Sufyan on the day of the Fateh, Makkah, they will be saved. So his house is like a safety place. That is the only thing he got. But you know, we all know what happened later on. That you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala led Prophet Muhammad into the Makkah. And you know, he conquered the Makkah without any bloodshed without any bloodshed, and Allah has given the true victory. Now, so this is the background of the surah. So obviously the surah is, is not a short surah. It is a 29 ayah, and it's four and a half page. So if we start one ayah, and, and the surah is so profound, uh, and if we, if we want to go to the Arabic analysis of the surah, it will take maybe hours, maybe two days or something. But so I'm going to very quickly go through the ayahs, you know, I'll do do the English translation just to give a normal idea because many of us we, we always when we read Quran we just read Quran we don't we don't look into the surah and there are few surahs you know they're so profound and especially this surah because a lot of the surah at the beginning in the Makkah surah it talks about the prophets of the other time like surah Yusuf uh, like surah Maryam surah Kahab all these things everything is important but this surah is so much integrated with the life of Rasulullah and that's why he said you know I love it more than anything the sun touches. So that's why we, as a Muslim, we should at least read through the translation of the surah. Even if you don't understand the every Arabic word of it, or you know the grammatical thing, but at least we should go through this one. So inshallah, we'll, we'll start very quickly, and I'll try to wrap it up in 10, 15 minutes, inshallah. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inna fathan and like a fatham mubina. So Allah is saying, so this surah actually has 11 sections. In, in 29, I have 11 sections. The first section, uh, which is ayah number, you can say one, two, and three. It is for only for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Where Allah subhanahu wa taala saying that I have given you a clear victory. Inna fatah nayaka fatham mubina, a clear victory. Now, then the next ayah. This is the first ayah, ayah number one. Very simple, short ayah. That you know, verily, we have given you a clear victory. Now, the word fatah is you all know that the same word as fatiha. This means opening or or victory or you know something that opens up so Allah is saying that you know something is open up for you you know and it is clear it is clear when there's no no more barrier inside it so it's going to be all all the way down then the next time Allah said why did I give you this victory so Allah is giving the reasoning now he's saying Allah is saying and this ayah actually if you go through different tafsir this ayah has a, is a problem in the sense from the Mufassirun point of view. Because this ayah is saying that Allah may forgive, forgive the zam of Rasulullah. So meaning, and the before and after meaning, Rasulullah did something wrong, some sin or you know something that previously and in the future Allah has forgiven this. First of all, with the victory and forgiving sin doesn't match. Second of all, Prophet Islam is Prophet Islam. He can't do anything. I mean, he can't do any sin, he's innocent, you know, he's the best master of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does this ayah mean? To understand this ayah, one word I'm just going to a little bit uh, emphasize, Allah said, to zambika. Zambik means, uh, in, 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 in English standard, you'll see like, even the translation that I'm looking at, it's sins. But the sins has a lot of Arabic word, you know, sayyat is sin also. Sayyat means something that is ugly sin. You know, is, ism also sin. You know, asim or ism is also sin. There is something that happened, like if you if you something obligated to do and you don't do it, that is ism. Meaning like you're supposed to fast in the month of Ramadan and you, 
you just need to ensure it's an I'm not going to fast. So that's a, a ism, ism kabira, you can say, like a, a major sin or a minor sin. So there are different words for sin. But Allah used the word zam. Zam, the word, the true word in the Arabic language is so beautiful that it comes from a root word. And the root word of zam actually is zanab. Zanab means a tail. A tail. The animal has a tail. It comes from it's the same word. And the tail of an animal is the most embarrassing part of the, of the, of the body. Like if a man, you know, he has a tail, you know, if you, if you, if you wear a dress like that, that's something embarrassing. So zam here doesn't mean sin actually. It means something that Professor Zan thought that it's embarrassing for him, something in the past. Now, what could be embarrassing to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, I'll give you an example, like you know, everybody, like every person has a different standard in their life, okay? And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the true Prophet, you know, and he is the, 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 he's the leader of all the Prophets, he has another standard. Suppose a person, I'll give you some examples so you understand, suppose a person comes to Fajr prayer every day, and the first, he's the first person to come into the masjid in the Fajr prayer, he gives the azan. Okay, and he never misses. And he is very happy about that. But one day, because of something, he was late. He comes to Fajr prayer, but he stands in the last row. He stands in the last row and he caught the second rakah. Another person, he never could come to Fajr. He never came to Fajr ever. But he's trying his best to come to Fajr. So that day he could wake up. And somehow he managed to come and catch the second data, standing beside that same person who comes every day in the morning. That person who comes you know, every day and gives the azan and everything, open the masjid for everybody, he is very sad today. Because he is missing his fall in the, beside the imam. That's what's fault. He, always, he never misses that. But today he's saying, you know, what did I do last night? Why didn't I set my alarm on the right place? How come I miss this one? So he's not happy. The person beside him, he never comes. He's very happy. Because he thinks, you know, this is my day. Because I came today in the Fajr, maybe Allah will forgive all my sin and I'm going to Jannah. Because I could never do it. So that they are doing the same kind of deed, but because of their standard is different. So just like this, Prophet Sallallahu standard is much more higher than us. So for anything for them, you know, is Prophet Sallallahu that is an embarrassment. We can't even think of that. And Allah actually give example in the Quran for this. I'll give one example and you'll understand. You all know this example actually. You know the, the story of Abba Sawa Tawalla, right? The, 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 the blind Sahaba, Abdullah ibn Ma'ud al-Maktum, he came and he asked something to Prophet Sallam. While Prophet Sallam was talking to some of, the, some of the elite groups of the elite members of the Quraysh, what, did he, what, what was the situation? Prophet Sallam, Allah said, Abba Sawa Tawalla. Abba Sawa means to do some frowning, make some, you know, bulging in your, like, eyebrow, not saying anything. So when Abdullah ibn Abu Maktum came, and he's not deaf, he's blind. So he can hear that Prophet Sallam is talking to some other people, but he still stopped him. He said, oh Prophet I have some question, I have some question. And Prophet Sallam didn't say, okay, can you stop now? Can you wait for me? He didn't say anything. He frowned. And he's a blind man. He doesn't even know what's going on in that forehead of Prophet Sallam. Still Allah sent the Quran at that time. Allah said, no, you should not even do that. Although the guy couldn't see what's happening. He's blind. He doesn't know what his frowning means. He can't see that. But even for that, Prophet cannot do that. And that is why Allah sent the whole surah about this Abba Sawa Tawalla. And Allah said, no, he comes for guidance, you have to give him the guidance. And if Allah wished, like this surah is, has a lot of prediction in this surah. This surah came when they are going back to Medina. But if you read the surah, and we'll talk about this inshallah, that Allah is telling something that's going to happen when you're going you're to go to Medina. Allah is giving indication here about the battle of Khaybar. That's going to happen after this one. Allah giving indication that they're going to battle with, with the Roman people, you know, the battle of Mu'tah. Allah giving all indication in the surah. So Allah giving future information in this surah. But for the Abbas Tawalla, Allah would have told Prophet Sallam, look, this blind guy is coming. So finish your talk. When he comes, you talk to him. He could have told him. But Allah didn't do that. Allah waited for him. Prophet Sallam frowned and Allah corrected him. And there's many occasions, there's another multiple occasions in the life of Prophet Sallam. So this here, Zam, means this kind of situation where Prophet Sallam thought that, you know, he could have done it better. He could have done this in a better way. Although to our standard, we can't even think of that. And that's what Allah was saying that, you know, because of this victory, I will forgive your things that you have feel embarrassed for yourself and the things that you're going to do some in future, you know, I'll even forgive that one. And, and that's what also, you know, even in the Battle of Tabuk, 
you know, he, he excused some people, you know, some people came, some munafikun came with some the weird ex you know, excuses. One of the guys, he came, you know, yeah, Rasulullah, we are going to battle of Muta, on that way there will be some beautiful omens, you know, and, you know, when beautiful women see me, you know, I can control myself, they can control myself. He's giving all these lame excuses, and, and Prophet Sallallahu know that he's a munafikun, but he also excused him. But Allah corrected Prophet Sallallahu no, you shouldn't have excused them. You should, have, you, you should know that they are not Allah could have corrected him before, but he did it later. So this kind of thing Allah is saying that, you know, I will forgive you your past and the present things that you are embarrassed of. And also Allah say that, what you nimmu ni'matahu alayka, wa yutimmu. Wa yutimmu means that, you know, Allah will complete his blessings. What is the complete of blessings means for Prophet Muhammad It means that his mission will be completed. His mission is to clear the Kaaba from the shirk. To clear the house of Ibrahim from the shirk. And that's what he's going to do. Allah is saying, Allah is giving the guarantee that you will be done that. Your ni'mah, your blessing will be fulfilled. And also, وَيَحْدِيَكَ سِرَاطًا مُسْتَقِيمًا And I will guide you to the Sirat al-Mustaqim. Now also, Prophet is already on Sirat al-Mustaqim, right? Obviously, why he needs guidance? He is the Prophet of Allah, so he's already in the Sirat al-Mustaqim. But this Sirat al-Mustaqim means here that, you know, he will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make a straight line from this Hudaybiyah to Makkah. Meaning there will be no barrier in between them. It will be just like a Sirat al Mustaqim that the winning, winning is you know straightforward and you know inshallah Allah will give the victory. And then Allah say, Wa iyan Allahu Nasran Aziza. Allah will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will will give you a, a, a help that is a mighty help. That is a mighty help. Now the fat and nasr, nasr means help, nasr and fat means victory. Do you know any surah that two words comes together? I think you all know. Izaza anasrullahi wal fat. Over there, Allah said the nasr before. Allah said when the Allah's helps come, you will see a lot of people are gathering. Here, Allah said fat first, nasr second. Usually, how you get victory? When Allah helps you, then you can win something. But Allah said, no, I have given you victory. Help will come later on. What this help? This help points to the victory of Makkah. When Allah's help will come and they don't even have to fight it at all, it will be a clear, clear victory for them. So this is what Allah said, I one, two, three about about the about the uh, blessings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the next thing is about the next section. You know, I cannot go through the 11th section because it's too big uh, to finish. The next section talk about the, the believer. And Allah is saying here, you know, anzala fi sakinata kurubi fil mu'minina li yazdadu imanahum ma'am imanihim. Wallahu junudu samawati wa kana Allahu aliman hakima. Allah is saying to the believer that, you know, on the believer's heart, Allah puts sakina. Sakina means tranquility. And Allah put the sakina. Because if the sakina was not there, they would have fight. And if they would have fight, they would have lost life. The Quraysh would have lost life. The Kaaba would be blooded. All these things would get, go messy. But Allah said, no, I put sakina in their heart. And because of the second, Allah said that you want to fight with them, don't you know that, you know, Walillahi Junud is Samawati Ula. Junud means the army. The Allah, to Allah belongs all the army of the skies and the, and the land. So don't worry about those, these enemies. This is not your goal. The Fatha, the victory is for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For you believers, your most important thing that your Sakina. And the next time Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that, and why I give you Sakina? The reason for it, so your Iman goes top. Meaning, whatever you Iman you at that moment have, you have more Iman. And not only that, I will enter into the Jannah and I will forgive your sin. I will enter into the Jannah and I will forgive your sin. Because this is the goal of the believer. And this is not the message for the Sahaba only. This is the message of all of us. That you know, the mission of Rasulullah was to Fatih Makkah, which he completed with the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, the believer helped him because they are the Ansar, they are the Muhajir, they helped him. But the goal of the normal Muslim like you and me, it is the goal that, you know, we seek Allah's forgiveness. And Allah will forgive us and that's the time we'll go to Jannah. And there's a lot of other things, you know. Allah talked about that when he's going to enter into the Jannah. Then he said, on the same ayah, he said, I'm going to forgive your sin. But if you think, how can you go to Jannah before forgiving your sin? Because Allah is saying that Jannah is kind of guaranteed for a true mu'min. The forgiving of sin is something if you have doubt in your mind, it will be forgiven. It will be forgiven. Also, in the beginning, when he talked, uh, the first section, that Allah talked, 
four things about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that, you know, I have given a victory. For what? The reason is, you know, I'm going to clear your previous and past things that you're embarrassed of. I will also give you a building, I will fulfill your blessings. I will also give you a ni'mah and also I will I'll, I'll, I'll guide you to a straight path to the victory and also I will give you a nasara, a strong help. So four things Allah told Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the next section where Allah talked about the believer, same thing Allah said, I have given you sakina, meaning tranquility. For what? Because I want your iman to go more than what you have in your iman. That's number one thing. Number two, that I am going to give you enter into the Jannah. I will give, give you enter Jannah. And then number three, that I will give you your for all sins been forgiven. And the number four, that that is the true success. The, the true success Allah declared as Fawzan Azima, that's the true success. And then Allah SWT, we're not going to go into the details, and later on Allah SWT talked about the people, what's going to happen when you go to Medina, Allah talked about Munafikun, that they will, some of them will say that, you know, oh, Prophet Muhammad SAW, you know, we couldn't go because our money, our children, we have business, so we couldn't go with you, Hudaybe. So there's a lot of people who are left behind in Medina. They intentionally, they didn't, they didn't went with Rasulullah SAW. And Allah didn't call them, Allah, one act Allah said that, no, they are Munafikun, but another act Allah said, Mukhalifuna. Mukhalifuna means people who left behind. Most of them were intentionally didn't go, but a few of them, they had, they had basically, uh, they are, like some of the Allah mentioned, that they are blind, they were lame, they have sickness, so they couldn't go there at all. So Allah talked about that, that one. And toward the end, when you go to the end of the surah, Allah talked about that, you know, the glad tidings, more reward, more bounties is coming for you very soon. First Allah said, Fathan Mubina, and the same surah Allah said, Fathan Qariba, there's a, there's a true victory, near victory is coming, and that is the indication of the Khaybar. And as you all know that you know, in the Khaybar, Prophet Islam earned a lot of wealth, the Muslim earned a lot of lot of wealth in, in, the, in, the, in that battle, in that siege. And the, at the end of the surah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, I'm just going to the end of the last ayah. And this ayah is, is special because all the Arabic letters from Alif to Ya, all the letters we'll find in this ayah. That's number one. This ayah also starts with the name Muhammad Rasulullah. Just like three other times in the Quran. And one time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned as Ahmed. This surah also said, that I'm just going to recite that I'm going to finish this one. Allah says here that Allah talking to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Wallazina ma'ahum, people who are with you, Ashaddu ala al kuffari wa rahma bainahum. Meaning they are very strict against the kuffar. But they didn't fight with the kuffar at all actually. They didn't fight with the Quraysh. And even in the Fatima, they didn't fight. But Allah said, no, their sakina, their tranquility was a true strong thing. That makes the other side weak. You know, this is the, their main feature that they have. They have the tranquility in their heart. And then Allah says, say, say that, you know, tarahum. Tarahum is you will see. So Allah is telling Prophet Sallam that you will see your people, that the people I'm talking about, who are with you, who helped you in this one. Tarahum rukkaun sujjadaun wa bainahum fatlam min fatlam min Allah. You will see them doing ruku and sujud. And this is the Indian, this is the last thing Prophet saw to the Sahaba. When he was in his deathbed, you know, beside in his room, when he turned the curtain away, he saw that Abu Bakr is leading the prayer. And all the Sahaba doing. That is the true mission of Rasulullah. He saw that these people, the who helped them, they are in the state of ruku and sujood. And that is the most important quality. Because once you have your iman like this, they are united, they're praying, they're sujood and ruku, they're doing then everything will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the main message of the surah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, these people, they will have marks in their head of the sujood. Okay, and this is not like a physical mark, but you know, you will see the humility in their face. Because when you say mark of the sujood, that's, that's point the humility. And then he said, that you will find the example of these people in Torah. But if you look at Torah now, if you go read the Old Testament, you will never find any verses about sujood. But Allah is saying that I have examples like of these people who pray, who ruku, who do sujood, who have signs in the thing, in the Torah. Clearly Allah said that. So why you couldn't find that? Because those people take it away. So if you go to any Jewish rabbi or Jewish people, they have never, they have taken the, all the ayah of the sujood from their book. And they have no ritual about sajda. You know, I, I asked, I, I looked it up you know, some, in, in some lecture, 
that this is their once a year they do sudu. Sometimes once a year the Jewish people make sudu, they fall down and pray. Other than that, they never have sudu. It's not there in their book anymore. Then Allah said the same thing, not only in Torah. Allah said these examples are also in Bible, in Injil, and this kind of people. And actually, Allah said in the Quran in another place, in Surah Al-Saf, Allah said, you know, that there are people who are Ansar of Isa and they did the same thing. And then at the end of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these are the people, they are like, these are your, like, a, like a crop. Like you are, the, you are putting the seed, you are a farmer, Prophet Sallallahu is a farmer, you put the seed inside and now they are going up and they are so strong that you know, the victory will come from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and Allah's Rahmah and Mercy will come to this. So inshallah ta'ala, with this one we'll finish. Uh, I'm thinking you know, in future inshallah if we have more time we'll go by ayah by ayah. And in the, in the 29th ayah, there's one ayah in ayah number 14. If you, if you have time, if you go and read even that English translation, you will see the 14 ayah, among the 29 ayah is the middle ayah basically. So there are 13 ayahs before that and 15 ayahs after that. And you will see just like any other surah, and most like you know, even surah Baqarah, and in the surah Baqarah ayatul kursi, there is a ring structure there. So the 14 ayah, the section above it and the below it talks about the same thing. And the section 2 above it and section 2 below it talks about the same thing. And at the beginning Allah said the Fatham, Mubina, that Allah talks about the forgiveness, at the end also Allah talks about forgiveness. And it is so beautifully organized. You know, these are the things that, you know, is, is, is in the Quran, but you know, it just need our time and effort to understand this one. So inshallah, Allah may Allah give us the to understand the Quran and, you know, implement this in our life and to get the, the wisdom behind it, to appreciate the Quran as much as Allah wants us to, and so that, you know, our Iman also go up, as Allah is saying, you know, Iman is the main thing. This is what Allah is saying. And for us, the Fatih is the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah make the people of, all of us people of the forgiveness and inshallah ta'ala give us in the Jannah in this dunya and the Akhirah. Jazakallahu khairan, subhanakallahu alhamdulillah, shadu Allah ilhan, sadaqlu wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa ta'ala wa